and I will talk a bit about our experience from HPC systems and also compared to our local clusters. I can say beforehand that the first half of this talk will describe sort of the applications of our methods and the second one will be more technical. So first, what is it we are doing? So we are looking at mainly what is called transdermal drug administration. So we want to see how does a drug compound pass through the skin barrier. And why that is interesting is that when we take drugs through uh, the mouth or peroral administration, the drug first has to pass through uh, the liver and is often to some extent metabolized there, which can both reduce the um, dosage or the concentration of the drug and also give side effects before you even get any real effects. If you take a drug through skin or as an injection, you can get rid of that. So you could compare transdermal administration more to uh, injections rather than peroral administration where we can compare them, but it's a lot easier and safer to take a drug as a skin patch or as, for example, a gel. The problem is that it's quite difficult to get the drug through skin. We are all very happy that the skin is as efficient a barrier as it is, because that enables us to live on land. Otherwise, we would very quickly be lose the water that we have in our bodies, and we would also be intoxicated by chemicals surrounding us. But we would like to see how we can overcome this barrier. So we are using uh, molecular dynamic simulations. So this has now been presented before. So I thank Matteo and Fabian to, for uh, introducing this, because I don't have to do that. Uh, so we started building a barrier or a model of the skin barrier which is actually the lipids that are stacked between the dead cells in the uppermost layer of the skin. So between those flat dead cells called corneocytes, you have lots of lipids forming a matrix there. And these lipids had been studied by cryoEM microscopy. And there were lots of images of what this structure looked like, but on a larger scale. And then we came in as researchers before this company was formed, where we used MD simulations to uh, predict the structure of this barrier, comparing EM images from our simulation output to the cryo experimental cryo EM, EM images until we found a good match. And then we use that atomistic model of the barrier to calculate the permeability through the skin barrier. And one advantage with these simulations is that we can actually understand things which can be observed in experiment but not easily interpreted. So we get a different time and um, detail scale that is not accessible by other means. So why would we like to do this and why? what kind of information can we get? So one thing here is just a sketch of, simplified sketch here that we can show as a drug passes through this skin barrier, illustrated now from above to below you might see that it can have different sort of regions in the barrier which has different permeation resistance where a high peak here means that it's difficult to pass through that region for this specific drug. And this means that it's easier to understand 
how we can improve the, the permeability and we can also see how different ingredients can be combined to sort of address all these barriers that we must be overcome. We can also see where excipients or ingredients in transdermal formulations that are used as permeation enhancers, where they are active in the skin barrier. So that you not only know that they work, but also understand how they work and how they can be combined. We can also get an early sort of screening method to see what drugs are suitable for further optimizations, either uh, compound optimizations or optimizations of the formulation, or if it might be better to look for something else if you want to take it to through skin. So this is just our latest publication showing our uh, results where we calculate the permeability of drug compounds through skin and compare that to previously published uh, lab measurements. The problem with these lab measurements is that they are not that reliable. They have been uh, published over a period of approximately 50 years using different uh, methods and the results vary a little bit from lab to lab and also if they just ad adjust temperatures a little bit in the same lab they get a little bit different measurements. But we see here at least that we have a fairly good agreement between our results. We have marked here two large outliers where one of them we believe is because of experimental data. There is one experimental data measure point there and it's it's not really in line with other similar compounds, whereas the other large outlier down here is probably a biomolecular force field uh, deficiency, that we have difficulties cal calculating or simulating this compound, which is something that we must learn and see how we can learn that beforehand, before we spend too much time on uh, these calculations. So I talked a little bit about uh, transdermal formulations as well, and this picture might look a little bit overwhelming. But the first part we have already gone through. So this is just the information that we can get about the single permeant or molecule that we want to get through skin. Then I show below approximately the process that is often used by pharmaceutical companies, and then they test their most commonly used excipients, often one at a time, or in some cases combined two of them together, and uh, see which of these are most efficient. And they look at the uh, increased permeability. And then they often proceed with the best one, or perhaps the second best one, if there are reasons why the first one might not work. But what we can then see from our simulations is that usually the best ones would lower the highest peak in the permeation resistance, but perhaps not have any effect on the second highest. And that is very difficult for them to find in their experiments because they see, oh, we have a large effect here because we have make it easier to go through where it's most difficult. Whereas we can then also see, okay, we have ingredients that might be ranked very poorly here, which only affects the second highest barrier, which is, gives you almost no noticeable effect in the lab. But we can then say, try to combine these two, or perhaps even suggest other compounds that they hadn't even thought about, and then say, use these, this mixture instead. And we did this procedure with a large pharmaceutical company last year, and we had a large good outcome from that. Unfortunately, I cannot tell you any details about the results or even name the company. So in our simulations, we use uh, the Gromax 
molecular dynamics uh, simulation uh, software package. Uh, that is open source and developed in many parts of the world, but the main development cluster is at Stockholm University and KTH. And we are working uh, physically in the same lab space as them, so we are tightly integrated with them. So we are sitting at SciLife Lab in Solna, and we are also actively uh, involved in the development team. And of course, that helps when we run into obstacles or perhaps that we see that some of our simulations are not as quick as we would like, we can sit down together with them and then try to improve the software further. Uh, one thing that is a little bit outstanding with Gromax is that it's uh, very good to efficiently use both CPU and GPU resources either um, in combination or just one of them. So, well, you cannot use only GPU resources very efficiently for the simulations I am running, but otherwise you can use and combine them together to get this, so that you don't let your CPU resources be idle and only use your GPU, for example. There are also quite sophisticated algorithms to enhance the sampling because we have heard before that uh, MD simulations are notoriously slow, especially if you want to simulate large systems or on long time scales. So this is just an, a plot here where we can see that all atom simulations which we are doing is usually realistic to do in sort of a microsecond time scale here. But the permeability process, if we would just put the molecule there and let it permeate through, even if we are just use, uh, calculating a small part of the skin barrier system, it will still take many years to run these simulations if there were no, no smart algorithms to accelerate the sampling. So we have a fairly good internal resource or I, at least we think so. So we have our own uh, company cluster of 18 GPU nodes, and we have also access to uh, an academic cluster, which can be used for um, re results that we publish. So there we have an access to in theory, 30 additional nodes, but we must make sure that if someone else puts their jobs in their queue, in the queue, we stop our jobs. So in, for real, we usually have access to 10 or 15 of these servers. Before we invested in our uh, compute infrastructure, we tried to make, make sure that this actually makes sense, but we found that an investment like this is actually cheaper after like one year compared to calculating on Amazon or Google. And even then using uh, current HPC resources, they are usually cheaper, but still I think it would say that in three years we are better off using our own hardware, which is a little bit worrying, I think. But one explanation here is that we are using uh, consumer uh, gamer GPUs, which are a factor of four or five cheaper than uh, server GPUs. So that is not something you, that you are allowed to do at a large scale HPC center, but as end users, we can do that. Currently, we have recently had access to uh, a development call at uh, Vega. Uh, we are we actually used our resources there in two weeks approximately. Then we got it a little bit extended, but then we are, were asked to apply for a proper regular access call, and we are awaiting the uh, uh, outcome of that in uh, I guess this month. So hopefully we will get the full access there, which will help us more to focus all sort of open. Uh, research 
on Vega and the sort of academic cluster that we can use and use our own cluster for internal development or uh, collaborations or commercial applications with uh, commercial partners. Before we started using Vega, we also had access on SNCC resources. We have been working with Peskov, Dardell, and Tetralist before. So we have tried quite a few different HPC systems with different resources. Of these three, it's only Tetralist that has uh, GPUs, for example. But of course, Vega has GPUs as well. And uh, yeah, this is not, yeah, we can just mention that for our resources, we do not need very much uh, RAM on the nodes. But one thing that is a little bit special is that we need a whole node allocation at a time because it's not very efficient for the uh, sort of optimizations in the program if the resources are shared and that the usage on the other uh, shared course or other course that we don't use can be used by others. So then we need to allocate and use the whole node at a time to get full performance. We see that this is just an example of a slightly different system, but it scales up to the, well, here it's four GPU nodes or eight CPU nodes, but after that, it's not worth trying to scale this up anymore. Already eight GPU nodes here is quite questionable. Of course, we can use the resources more efficiently by scaling up the system instead, but then it's more or less, less just a waste of resources, even if we can scale up further. So just a comparison then to why it's interesting to use HPC systems is mainly if we just look the time from sort of question to answer. And if we compare our, if we use three of our nodes, we can get the time down to five days. Whereas on Vega, we can get it down to two and a half days. And this is for one set of simulations, and we try to use run four in a combination to get better statistics. So it's quite compute intensive, and we want to get the time from question to answer down as much as possible. But already here, we can see that even if the CPU nodes are a lot slower, we can still get a lot larger allocations there. So if we have routine jobs that we don't need questions or answers very quickly, it can be a very good resource to use them as well. So just to wrap this up, I have just a few observations here. First, I want to thank ENCCS for help with the allocations to the uh, development and the regular access calls. And I really want to push forward here that the uh, European HPC joint undertaking is a very valuable resource for industry. But one thing I want to bring up is that it's quite difficult to know what is expected from you as a company, be it a large company or an SME, when it comes to publication of results, where in the HPC, uh, your HPC JU decision says you are, you must publish the results from the Vega terms of use, unless otherwise agreed or specified, you must publish the results. And when we talk to ENCCS, it says you probably don't really need to publish the results. So it's, I think that's something that really needs to be clarified. What is expected from um, SMEs and industrial partners so that we, know what calculation to run where. So in our case, we can still distribute the calculations differently, but especially if you don't have your local resources, then it's very important that you don't fail this. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and leave the floor to questions. Thank you very much, Mike.